know, when we come to a book like Zephaniah, it, sometimes it can seem worlds away from, from where we're at. And if, if you have read it, uh, you probably did so very quickly. Uh, maybe you ended up just kind of thinking, what, what, if anything, does this have to do with me? And, and you know, I always want to remind you of, of 2 Timothy 3.16. Right? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So that means that as we come to this Old Testament book of Zephaniah that was written to the nation of Judah in the 600s uh, B.C., that it still has application for you and I. We saw this morning the power of the Word of God. Right? Hebrews 4.12 says it is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And the reality is we, re- we can read a book that was written thousands of years ago, and yet it can speak to us, and it's profitable for us for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that's true of the book of Zephaniah as well. So we're going to dig in tonight. We're just going to read. Uh, it's only three chapters, and so we're going to work our way through it. We'll just read a little bit. We'll talk a little bit. We'll read a little bit. Lord willing, we'll get all the way through. All right, so that's the plan for tonight. Uh, we'll start in verse 1. It simply says, The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, In the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. All right, now, did you follow that? (laughs) There's a lot of ayahs. So we we, we learn a little bit uh, more about Zephaniah than we do about many of the other minor prophets. They usually introduce themselves. We know very little about them, and we don't know much about Zephaniah either, but we do know he gives us some some genealogy. He goes back four generations, which is very unusual. Uh, and, And the reason he goes back so far is he goes back to a man named Hezekiah. That should sound familiar to you because he was a king. He was a good king, and he reigned over Judah for a long period of time. Uh, And so Zephaniah comes from a kingly lineage, and and that's important to realize. It sets him apart from all of the other minor prophets. We've seen shepherds, and and, and, this is someone who would have had access to uh, to the king, to the priest, uh, to the spiritual leaders in the nation of Judah. Uh, and so that's significant. And it says, he wrote in the days of Josiah. So this tells us not only you know, who wrote the book, but also when it was written. Josiah, uh, Troy made reference to last Sunday when we looked at Habakkuk. Uh, he, was, he, was, he became king when he was eight years old. Uh, and so you know, he, he had an early start. And uh, God used him. Uh, he was one of those good kings, kings over the southern kingdom of Judah. And we're late now in this period. And, and so it's, it's important for you to, to understand where we're at in, 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 in Israel's um, history. Right, so the northern kingdom of Israel has already been, uh, they've been captive by the nation of Assyria. Uh, the southern kingdom should have seen the writing on the wall and, and, and judgment is coming from the nation of Babylon. Right, so just kind of to give you an idea, we know that Josiah reigned in the year 640 to 609. He had about a 30-year reign uh, and, and very foolishly, uh, in his pride, went out to battle and was killed in battle. Um, but prior to that time, led some, led some revival, led some reforms in the nation of Judah that you know, got rid of... Uh, Idol worship, uh, they found the book of the law and began to follow, insti- reinstituted the Passover after hundreds of years. Right, so this was a king who began to, to hear the word of God and began to follow the word of God. And Zephaniah was ministering during this time. Um, now, there's some clues within the book that help us kind of narrow down the time period in which, um, in which he would have been prophesying. Uh, we know that the nation of Assyria fell to the Babylonians in 612. And Zephaniah is going to make mention of the fall of the Assyrians in this prophecy. So we know it was prior to the fall of the Assyrians. Right? So we, we know that it, his, his, his words were written before that time. And when you're reading it and you see the condition of the nation of Israel, you see their idolatry, you see their sin, their moral condition, then we would assume that it was also written prior to the reforms that Josiah instituted. Now, what's that mean? That means that this book of Zephaniah played a part, this prophecy played a part in the revival of the nation of Judah. Now, it was short-lived, but this word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah 
was part of the reform that happened in the nation of Judah. And so there's something here for us tonight. Just, you know, w- when, you, when you look and you ask yourself, you know, what would God want to say to his people who are in need of revival, in need of restoration? And when we look at the, be- the book of Zephaniah, we see what, what God would say to a people who, who need revival, who are in the midst of sin, rebellion, who are hurting, uh, who, are, who are facing the fear of, of a foreign nation. Uh, you know, this is the people who are, who are scared. You know, those who yet fear the Lord are, are, are in dismay over the condition uh, of the nation around them. And, and so we can relate to that. As, as, you know, we often consider, we, you know, people will, will consider America a Christian nation. Uh, we're what most people consider us now a post-Christian nation. And we, we our hearts break over the condition that we see around us. Um, so we can relate to maybe how people are feeling. Uh, but we also see God's message to a nation who has wandered far from him. Now, we're going to see in the book of Zephaniah, and it's only three chapters, but in this little, in this little book, the, the, the word or, or, or the phrase, the day of the Lord, is mentioned more than any other book. So the, the theme of the book of Zephaniah is the day of the Lord. And so I want to make sure you understand what we're talking about. Right? The day of the Lord is different than the Lord's day. <laughs> the Lord's day is today, right? It's the day that we worship, the day we celebrate. Uh, you know, we, we do so because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, victory over sin, victory over death. And so we have this institution of the Lord's day that's set aside on the first day of the week. And, and we come and we worship together. But the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. Right? And so when you see that phrase, the day of the Lord, always think in your mind, judgment. Right? That's the theme of Zephaniah's book. God is going to judge. And in the first cup, or verses 2 and 3, we see the day of the Lord pronounced. Right? So in verse 2, listen carefully. He says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Now, that's that strong language. That's a picture of total and complete judgment. It's, it sounds very reminiscent of what? Of the flood. Right? If you go back to Genesis, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe them away. And, he does, and here, the picture is even more complete because he mentions the fishes. Right? I'm going to wipe away every, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. It's complete and total judgment. On the day of the Lord, every part that has been affected by sin will be judged. Right? And so that's the picture that we see when we think of the day of the Lord. Think of judgment. Think of God's wrath. Right? Now, now, that's not an easy message to proclaim, is it? It's one that has certainly fell on hard times in the day in which we live. <laughs> we see those who name the name of Christ and who want to, to kind of soft sell a, a, a gospel message who have avoided a message of wrath and sin altogether. They, <laughs> the Word of God doesn't allow us to do that. You very rarely hear a message that says something like this, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. You know, and the reality is, is that God has the right to do that. He's the one who made all things, and he has the right, if he so chooses, to obliterate all things. He's always going to operate within his character. And so holiness, righteousness, justice, he has the right to judge all sin. And he will do so. And yet, in his love and his grace, he saves a people for himself. And we'll see that play out as we walk through this this book together. So we see the day pronounced, and then we have an explanation in verses 4 through 12. He's just simply going to explain why this judgment is occurring. Now, if you look at verse 7, in the midst of this explanation, he says this, Be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests 
And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. Be silent before the Lord God. Here's, here's the judgment pronounced and explained, and God simply says, you just sit back and shut up. All right? Let me, let me tell you, they have no leg to stand on. Right? It, it, we see that very same picture in Romans chapter 3, right? when, when the, <laughs> the depravity of man is explained, and then it says they will have, they will have no word to say. There's, 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 no, there's, there's no defense before a holy God. And that's what he says here. Be silent. And, and, and I think there's two aspects. Number one, there's no defense. And then secondly, we've all been, we've all been in a place. Have you ever been in a place where you just stand speechless? You know, maybe, maybe you're standing over the Grand Canyon. You're looking out over the ocean. or You're just standing in awe of the grandeur and the beauty and the majesty of whatever it is that's before you. You, you just say, I'm speechless. Well, Behold our God, <laughs> seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Right? We Be silent before him. That's the, the, the picture here. It says the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. The sacrifice is those who are being judged. He's invited guests. Those are the Babylonians who are coming to judge the people of Israel. It's a gruesome picture. It says he's going to judge all those who array themselves in foreign attire. And we get some insight into why God's judging his people. Remember, this is judgment explained. You know, what, what does that mean, judge, dressed in foreign attire? And it simply means they're adopting the practices of the nations around them. They look more like, they look more like the world than they do like the people of God. God wants his people to be distinct. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. What fellowship has light with darkness? And yet, we see the nation of Israel is indistinguishable from, and, and in some ways has surpassed these other nations around them in, in evil and in wickedness. They want to be like the world. Things don't change a lot, do they? Many people would characterize the church today as trying to be like the world, trying to be relevant, trying to be... <laughs> trying trying to fit in, right? Trying not to stand out too much. And yet, we see here that God is judging his people for trying to be like the world. We should be distinct. We should be different. There should be something that stands out about the people of God. And down in verse 17, he says, I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Why is this judgment coming? It's simple. Because they have sinned. You say, why is the judgment so severe? Because of who they sinned against. They have sinned against the Lord. And so we see that the cost and the severity of sin here in, as he explains, why is this day of judgment coming? Well, it's because of sin. Now, what kind of sin? Well, <laughs> Zephaniah begins to kind of lay that out for us. And I'm, we're just going to read through this, starting in verse 4. And, and notice, the people of God don't escape the judgment here. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, in verses 2 and 3, he says, I'm going to cut off mankind from the face of the earth. It's universal, but here he narrows it in on his own people and we're reminded judgment starts with the church it starts with the people of god and here he says i'm stretching out my hand against judah and i will cut off from this place the remnant of baal and the name of the idolatrous priest along with the priest those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens those who bow down and swear to the lord and yet swear by milcom and those who have turned back from following the lord who do not seek the lord or inquire of him. Now, what's he calling out here? He's calling out the idolatrous practices of the nation. <laughs> they, they are worshiping other gods. There's Baal worship that's taking place. There's worship of other foreign gods. Even the priests are involved. And, and, and it's not like they've, 
they've completely went away from the Lord, they're mixing it. And they're saying, I'm still going to worship you, God, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pull in from this. And I'm going to pull... I want the best of everything the world has to offer. And what's the problem with that? God said what? You shall have no other gods before me. God is a jealous God. And so we see a picture here of God's judgment coming because of the idolatry of the nation. And not only their idolatry, but look down at verse 9, and we see the injustice is taking place. On that day, the day of the Lord, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. When that day declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, all inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. Now, the, the reference to the different gates and the inhabitants of the mortar is talking about the, the customs and the... And, and the money changers, and the traders, and it's talking about those who are ripping people off, right? And, and you saw in verse, uh, verse 9, violence and fraud. So they're abusing, they're abusing those who are <laughs> unable to help themselves. And so idolatry and injustice, and then verse 12, indifference. He says, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lambs, and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Right? So there are those in the nation who are simply saying, God doesn't really care what's going on. Right? He's not going to do anything good. He's not going to do anything bad. He's not going to bother us at all. There's no judgment coming. And, and it, it's not that different today. Right? There, there are those who just say, God doesn't care. God helps those who help themselves. Oh, but God here says complacency, indifference is sin. It's sin not to care. You know, some of you, that's, that's your great, right? You, you, you look at this and you see, wow, man, there's idolatry and, and, and there's injustice, there's violence, and yet lumped in with that is those who simply are indifferent. And that might be you tonight. It's not that you're necessarily out there, you know, living in sin. You're necessarily doing all these things you know you shouldn't do, but you just don't care. God's going to judge those who do not care, along with those who are actively pursuing sin and rebellion. Right? So we see this picture here of the nation, and then the day of the Lord is described in the rest of chapter 1. So we have a description here, beginning in verse 13, their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. Why? Because the Babylonians are coming. They're going to rip them out of their homes. Right? So they're not going to get to live. They're not going to get to enjoy the fruit of their, their labor. Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter the mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet blasts and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. You, you see a picture there of how, how serious God's judgment is. And it's a warning, right? The day is near. It's, it's coming. It's almost here. And it's going to be a terrible <laughs> darkness, gloom, distress, and anguish. And then he says in verse 18, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end, he will make all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, here he says what? That, that money that you gained, all that gold, that silver you gained through injustice, it will not help you. There is nothing that you have that's going to get you out of the judgment that you deserve. And it's interesting when you read this. It seems as if God moves back and forth right, in his message to the people between a, 
narrow judgment that is here, now, and present, and a wide judgment that seems to be far off into the future. And if you catch that, then you're catching kind of the theme of the book. There is an imminent judgment that is coming upon the nation of Judah, and it is near. Right? That's the, that's the, the Babylonians coming, and yet there's a far-off judgment that is also in view that is, that is for all the earth. Right? And so we're looking way off into the future, and some, some commentators compare it to two mountaintops. So you have, if, if you, you can never quite tell from a distance, you can never quite tell how much, how much space is between the mountains. And so you see this judgment, and you see this judgment, and, and that's what's happening here in this book of Zephaniah. There's a near judgment that's going to take place on the nation of Judah in the very near future, and there's a far-off judgment, ultimately, Right when Jesus Christ comes back to set all things right. right? And, and so we see both of those in play as we read through the book. Now, here's the good news. And there is good news. With all of this talk of judgment that is deserved, there's also a call to repentance. And you see it at the beginning of chapter 2. He says, gather together. Yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden with the day of the anger of the Lord. Wow. What's he saying? Come to me, return to me before it's too late. Before the day comes, seek after the Lord. And how do you seek after the Lord? Well, you seek after the Lord in humility, in righteousness. And, and, and even then, it's, it's, it's interesting, we're so, we're so far gone here that even if they turn to the Lord, there's no guarantee they're not going to experience the judgment that is coming upon the nation. He says, perhaps, perhaps... <laughs> you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. So, the call to repentance, God's grace here, and, and certainly a reminder right, for, for each of us that we must call on the Lord while he may be found. If you're here tonight and you're kind of playing around in your relationship with the Lord and you have yet to come to saving faith in Christ, the... The message of God's word to you is what? It's run to the Lord before it's too late. It's, it's come to him before the decree takes effect. Seek the Lord. And, and that would be my admonition to you tonight. Before it's too late, call on the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from, from the judgment that you justly deserve because of your sin. But we see grace here, a call to repentance, a call to turn away and turn back to the Lord. But then what we see really from verse 4 of chapter 2 all the way to verse 14 of chapter 3 is, is, is the day of the Lord accomplished. Right? So we saw it pronounced and we saw it described, but now we're going to see it play out. And again, there's a present reality for the people that it's being written to and a future reality for all generations, and we're going to see both. So let's focus, first of all, on the present day of the Lord. And you see it in, um, in chapter 2, verse 4, through chapter 3, verse 7. And it starts with the judgment of the nations. And it's interesting, and we're not going to read all of that uh, in chapter 2, because he's going to talk about these different nations that are surrounding the nation of Judah. And if you can just picture in your mind... Right? There's Judah on a map, and then there's nations all to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. And God is going to mention each of them in judgment. And each one of them has been a thorn in the nation of Israel's side. Right? They've, they've had to deal with them over the years. Uh, there's, been, there's been wars, and there's been uh, fighting, and there's been infiltration through false gods and idols. And, and there's been intermarriage over the years, and there's been a lot of difficulties with these nations surrounding surrounding the nation of Judah. And so what he does, starting on the west and moving east and then south and then north, finally with the nation of Assyria, is he says what? God's going to judge them all. 
Now, that would have been a great encouragement to the heart of the nation of Judah. These wicked, sinful nations that have oppressed us for years, God is going to judge. And ultimately, the nation of Assyria that wiped out the nation of Israel to the north, we see how God deals with them. In verse 13, he says, He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. Herds shall lie down in her midst, all kinds of beasts, even the owl and the hedgehog shall lodge in her capitals. A voice shall hoot in the window. Devastation will be on the threshold, for her cedar work will be laid bare. This is the exultant city that lives securely, that said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become. A lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. The mighty city of Nineveh and the nation of Assyria completely wiped out. A lair for wild beasts. What does that mean? There's no, there's no people left. God has fully judged the nation of Assyria. Now, that would have been a great encouragement to their heart, right? Those who have wronged them, God has dealt with. And yet, when you come to chapter 3, God's judgment centers back on the nation of Judah. And, and, and so we see in, 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 in verse 1, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. This is talking about Judah. It's talking about Jerusalem, right? that mighty capital. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. What a sad description. And I was reading that today. I thought, could that describe you? Could that describe your heart? Could it describe my heart? Someone who, who is, 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 we profess to know God, right? This is Judah. This is the people of God. And yet, it says what? She listens to no voice. <laughs> I, a rebellious heart will not accept correction, does not trust, will not draw near to God. This is the, this is the, the people that God will judge. His own people. Why? Because of their rebellion and their hardness of heart. And if, if you're here tonight and your heart is hard and you, you, you refuse to receive correction, you're in danger of God's chastisement. Hear, hear the message. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice each dawn. He does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. What's he saying here? He's saying even the leadership is completely corrupt. No, no portion has been untouched. He goes on to say, I've cut off the nations. Their battlements are in ruins. I have laid waste their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more, they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. You catch what he's saying? If anybody gets it, you should get it. You have seen me judge one nation after another. You saw, you got, they, they saw the nation of Israel to the north completely judged. And yet they still pursue their rebellion. They still refuse correction. Now, in, in an instant, here in the book of Zephaniah, we, shi Zephaniah, we shift. And we shift from that present judgment to the future judgment, right at verse 8. Right, so we saw the present. He judges the nations. He judges Judah. And then in verse 8, notice it says, Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord. Suddenly we're looking way off. He's saying, wait. <laughs> wait for me for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. You see how we moved from present judgment on the nation of Judah to future judgment on 
all nations. And, and this is a, when, when you hear God, the God of the universe say, I'm going to pour out upon them my indignation and my anger, that should cause us to tremble. You know, Jesus described this day in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24 and verse 21, he said, For then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. In those days, and if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. He describes here how, how drastic this time is when he comes to judge the earth. If it were not for his mercy, no one would be saved. But again, right, just as we saw a call to repentance, we see a glimmer of hope. Right, as you shift, as you come to verse 9, we move from judgment to restoration. In verse 9, it says, for at that time, what time? That day, the day of the Lord, that future day, at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. He's going to change, and, and, and here it, it, it mentions speech. Some people think that uh, it's going to be a change from that curse of Babel all the way back in Genesis 11 where he confused the language and he thinks they're going to give him one. I don't think that's what, he, what he's talking about. So oftentimes when we look at the scripture, he compares what? He compares our speech with our heart. And, and so when it says he's going to change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, it means he's going he's to give them a heart change, a heart that now is capable of worshiping rightly. I think of, of James 3.10. It says, from the same mouth comes blessing and curse, cursing. My brothers, this should not, this should not be so. Right? God's going to give them a pure speech that only is filled with blessing. Um, Jesus said in, in, in Luke 6.45, the good person... Out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of, the, out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so as God changes the heart of people, he changes their, their lips. Remember Isaiah said in, 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 in chapter, six, or chapter 6 of Isaiah, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What's he talking about? He's talking about their sin. And so here God's going to change. A people. There's restoration that's going to take place. In verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In the midst of this judgment that is rightly deserved, God has saved for himself a remnant, a people, for his own. And it, he, he's going to rescue. We see that picture again you know, at the, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is preaching in Mark 13, 27. He says, I will send out the angels, and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. God's going to bring his, his people. He's going to bring them from the four corners of the earth. He's going to restore them. He's going to rescue them. And in verse 11, on that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in, the holy, in my holy mountain, but I will leave in your midst a people, humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. That's a beautiful picture. This is, this is God working according to his promise and his covenant. He's going to restore this people for himself. And, and, and it's going to be a, a picture of, of perfection. And then the question then is this. How do you respond? How do you respond to the day of the Lord? Well, for those of us who know him, there should be joy. The, we, we see in, in the rest of the chapter the joy of the day of the Lord. Notice the response in verse 14. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Right? The coming day of the Lord should be a call to worship. Because God is going to set all things right. right? We see it in verse 15 through the, the end. He says, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. 
the king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, all Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. You'll no longer suffer. You'll no longer suffer reproach. The highlight is is verse 17, right? He is mighty to save. The Lord God is in your midst. The, The imagery is what? One day I will be your God. You will be my people. And we will dwell together in perfect fellowship And don't you love the imagery there? He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Can can you picture the Lord God singing over over you? That's, That's the imagery that we have in the scriptures. We sing to him, but in here... His love for us is is so powerful. He adores his people that he is singing over you. In fact, we we think of that that, uh, Old Testament, you know, the Song of Solomon. We think about the relationship between a husband and a wife, and we see that that, that that poetic imagery. But that love that's displayed is a good picture between God and his people, between Christ and his church, as he loves and adores them. And that's the imagery that we see here. Now, as we close, we always want to fix your eyes on Christ. Right? And, and so, you know, we're reminded that all Scripture is pointing us forward to Him. And, and so, how, how does this book of judgment and wrath point us forward to Christ? Um, and I, I thought of John 3, uh, 36 today. And it, it simply says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. You, you see... Jesus Christ is the one who took the wrath that we deserved. See, as a just and holy God, God can't just overlook our sin. He can't sweep it under the rug. He had to deal with it. And he dealt with our sin in Christ. Christ bore our sin in his body. Look at verse 15 there in Zephaniah chapter 3. The Lord has taken away the judgment against you. That's reason to sing. That's reason to celebrate. The judgment that you and I deserve, he has taken away. How? In Christ. Jesus bore our wrath in his body on that tree. Fully, completely, it is finished kind of work. And then, he says, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So it points us to Christ, reminding us that he bore our sin in his body. But for all of those who reject him and who refuse to repent and put faith in him, the wrath of God remains. So when you read Zephaniah and you hear that message, repent, turn before it's too late, you should run to Jesus Christ. Because he's our only hope. Our only hope of salvation. Our only hope of restoration with the God who made us. And at the same time, as the people of God, we too can take courage. We too can take hope in the reality that there's coming a day when God is going to set all things right. No sin will be left unpunished. And we will dwell with him forever. What a day that will be. (laughs) How great is our God. Let's let's close in prayer.